and gentlemen, I've had my instructions to come up to the microphone because um, tonight's lecture has been recorded. And it's been recorded, I think, because this is a really topical discussion. Everyone will be aware that Syria has unfortunately been in the news for many years, and now eight years on uh, to the current conflict. It was something that was discussed uh, by Presidents Trump and Putin at yesterday's summit, but set against a context of ongoing aerial bombardments and attacks on hospitals and humanitarian convoys. And so today's discussion on the responses to the Syrian crisis um, with respect to chemical weapons um, is particularly appropriate. Um, and we're incredibly fortunate to be able to welcome um, a very distinguished speaker, Professor Tim McCormick, who is the Dean of Law at the University of Tasmania Law School and who has an incredibly distinguished um, research and practical experience um, in this area. As well as being Dean of the Law School, he is also uh, the Special Advisor on International Humanitarian Law to the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court. And a few years ago, he uh, was very prominently uh, involved uh, as an amicus curiae in the prosecution of Slobodan Milosevic um, in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, so he's someone whose research and whose experience um, in this area means that he has a great deal of expertise and we very much look forward um, to hearing him talk about the Syrian tragedy uh, and the responses um, to what's occurred with respect to chemical weapons and in other areas. Would you please welcome Professor McCormick. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. It's a great uh, privilege and honour for me to be appointed the New Zealand Law Foundation's Distinguished Visiting Fellow to New Zealand in 2018. So let me start by thanking my sponsors, Law Foundation, and also uh, both the Auckland University Law School and the Auckland University of Technology Law School in this joint public lecture. And to you too, I mean, a public lecture without some people coming in off the street is hardly, hardly lives up to the name. I uh, also want to acknowledge my uh, beloved wife and, and son, Diggory, uh, part of my family. There are a couple others uh, back in Australia, but it's really lovely to have them here tonight. And I note, just in passing, that I'm the first Tasmanian recipient of this great award for the New Zealand Law Foundation and the third uh, to be appointed from an Australian law school. I'm looking forward with reverberating and devastating effects. The International Committee of the Red Cross in 2015 described it as the largest and most complex humanitarian crisis in the world with no end in sight. Well, that's absolutely the case because three more years have passed since that, since that prescient insight was issued. The death toll in this conflict is now well over half a million. The United Nations stopped counting in 2014 at around 250,000 when they were no longer able to uh, be confident about the statistics or the data that they were receiving to keep track of the number of people being killed. The Syrian Centre for Policy Research on the ground in Syria estimated 470,000 dead in 2015 400,000 of them fatalities, an additional 70,000 from the collapse of the uh, health system in the country. And they too have struggled to keep up with an accurate assessment of the death toll, but uh, on their website estimate well over half a million. In addition to those deaths, which themselves are staggering, if you translated that into per capita deaths in this country of 4.8 or just under 4.8 million, we'd be talking about 144,000 or so deaths, about 3% of the population. Think through what that would mean for you and your extended network of contacts in New Zealand. In addition to half a million deaths in Syria, there have been 5.6 million at least who have fled the country and uh, poured over neighbouring borders into Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan and Iraq creating the largest single refugee crisis since World War II and inundating each of those four countries with huge um, implications in terms of trying to feed 
and house those teeming, teeming millions. In addition to that huge external flow out of the country, there's been an additional 6.1 million Syrians who've been displaced within their own country. And 13.1 million of them within Syria desperately dependent now on humanitarian assistance. So around 80 or maybe even 90% of the country dependent on humanitarian assistance just to survive. The economy of Syria is in tatters. Productivity is ruined. There have been huge numbers of the population dragged into abject poverty. But it all got initiated in 2011 with the so-called Arab Spring, a term that the Western media coined to describe this rising up, popular uprising in one Arab country after another, starting in Tunisia, but spreading around the fertile crescent. And the expectation back then, if you remember, was of a democratic dividend in each of these countries formerly subjected to totalitar totalitarian regimes. We now know that that promise has been an abject failure and certainly has not materialised. In Syria, the kicking off of uh, a popular uprising was met with a brutal response by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. He responded as his father before him did with a popular uprising in the uh, Syrian city of Hama in 1982. Some of you might be old enough to remember that uh, Hafez al-Assad sealed off that city and absolutely smashed the civilian population. And the estimates are between 20 to 40,000 slaughtered in Hama as a consequence of the initial emergence of the Muslim Brotherhood in that city. So Bashar al-Assad tried to do the same thing. This time uh, didn't work the same way because the country, uh, well, because the uprising spread popularly across multiple centres and because although you can seal off towns and you can kick out all the media and make sure no NGOs are present, it's a lot harder to stop people uploading almost real-time uh, video footage onto social media sites to, to demonstrate what's happening. I think before I talk about some intriguing academic or intellectual aspects of the conflict and multilateral responses to it. It's really important to acknowledge the devastation that has been wreaked upon this nation. And so I want to, I was going to say ask, but I'm actually not asking, I'm going to impose a 30 second period of silence that we collectively reflect upon the people of Syria and the devastation that's been imposed upon them. I don't want to launch into talking about my international legal interests in disparate responses to the use of chemical weapons and all the other atrocities that have gone on in that country without acknowledging the Syrian people. So let's do that together. and egregious violations of international law that have been perpetrated throughout this extended and protracted period of the Syria conflicts. There are three questions I'm keen to have an attempt at answering. What are those disparate responses, first of all? And secondly, why are they so different? And three, the third issue, what, what might be some of the emergent implications for international law through all of this? can't stop thinking to myself about what the response would be of a Vox Populi poll on the streets of any of the major cities in Syria that have been decimated. And to ask the population what international law means for them. And the answers would routinely and systematically surely be, are you kidding me? Uh, in terms of a constraining influence on the behaviour of nations or other actors, it must seem ludicrous to the people of Syria that international law purports to offer some holdout of 
efficacy. Kos Marty Koskinyemi described international law as the gentle civiliser of nations. Uh, there's not a lot on display that, that lives up to that descriptor in terms of this, uh, this series of conflicts. So let me start first of all with chemical weapons and just try to deal with some of the details about what's happened and uh, how the international community has responded. And then we can move to other atrocities, identify some of those and the relative lack of response to them and then move to the second question of why this disparate uh, response. When the Security Council, sorry, w when, um, when the Syria crisis first started spiralling out of control, concerns were expressed about Syria's chemical weapons stockpile and the possible use of those chemical weapons by the regime of Bashar al-Assad or perhaps even worse, the falling of those chemical weapon stockpiles into the hands of ISIS or other non-state armed groups. And goodness only knows what the implications of that might be. On the 20th of August 2012, President Obama, and yes, it's with some sense of nostalgia that we might refer back to the presidency of Barack Obama, but he made his famous red line speech. Some of you will remember it, perhaps others of you not. He said, we cannot have a situation where chemical or biological weapons are falling into the hands of the wrong people. A red line for us is we start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilised. That would change my calculus that would change my equation. Of course, then there was a great deal of speculation in the aftermath of that speech about what the implications of it might be. And if chemical weapons were used, whether President Obama and his administration might then use military force in response. It didn't actually take long for this statement to be put to the test. In fact, seven months to the day on the 20th of March 2013 there were allegations of chemical weapons use in suburbs of Aleppo and also in Damascus and those attacks were followed within days of additional allegations in Adra, in Sheikh Maksud and in Sarakeb. and in between the 20th of March and the 24th of March on the 21st Bashar al-Assad requested the UN Secretary General to launch an official investigation under the auspices of the UN Secretary General's mechanism which had been established in 1987. Some of you, again, with old enough memories right, might recall that during the, 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 the so-called Gulf War between Iran and Iraq, which went on for the most of the decade of the 1980s, there was extensive use of chemical weapons by Iraq against Iranian soldiers through most of the years of the 1980s and then in 1988 against uh, the Kurds in the north of Iraq, particularly in the village of Halabja, where 5,000 people were executed because of their ingestion of sarin, a nerve agent, in that town. Before the Halabja attack, the UN Secretary General established this mechanism and he was sending in, uh, expert investigative teams into both Iraq and the border area with Iran to look at um, victims of exposure to particularly mustard and sulfur mustard agents. I remember reading quite a bit about those investigative um, teams and their reports back because it happened that one of the group of experts was Australian who came from Tasmania and better still in terms of piquing my interest from my hometown of Burnie on the northwest coast of Tassie. Small town, how do we produce uh, an international chemical weapons Inspector, fascinating for a young person. Back then I was a lot younger than I am now, contemplating what might be possible. So here is Bashar al-Assad asking the Secretary General of the UN to please investigate, set up an investigative process and let's find out what happened. The investigative, investigative team was assembled and arrived in country on the 18th of August, 2013. And they were in Damascus preparing to go out to the areas where the allegations of chemical attacks had happened. 
They'd only been in the country for a few days when there was a, a major attack on the Damascus suburb of Ghouta by, uh, well, with a nerve agent, we've subsequently discovered that it was sarin that was sarin gas that was in that was uh, weaponized and delivered by surface to surface uh, rockets and we now know that 2000 people lost their lives from that attack this was on a much bigger scale than anything that had occurred in Syria before it and it captured global media attention some of you again will remember online images of witnesses struggling to breathe a victim sorry struggling to breathe of victims experiencing convulsions, of makeshift hospitals, and of row after row of dead bodies, many of them obviously children. There was a torrent of condemnation in response after these images were displayed. And of course, the US, uh, sorry, the UN Secretary General's in investigative team turned their attention to the Ghouta attack as a priority over the other attacks that had been alleged. On the 13th of September, so about three weeks after the deployment of the investigative team into, uh, into Syria, the investigative team produced a report on the Ghouta attack to the UN Secretary General. And they found in that report that sarin had been used and the, me the medium by which it had been delivered. The UN Secretary General was scathing in his response. He described this as a war crime, as a grave violation of the 1925 Geneva Protocol and claimed that the international community has a moral responsibility to hold the perpetrators of this particular attack accountable and to ensure that chemical weapons do not re-emerge as an instrument of warfare. Key question at that time is how will the Obama administration respond now that the red line has been so clearly, so spectacularly crossed? Between the Ghouta attack and the uh, delivery of the report to the Secretary General and his making of the findings public, uh, it became increasingly clear that there was anecdotal evidence to confirm the use of sarin, the delivery method and the number of um, victims that had, been, uh, that, had, that had suffered, that had died or had been wounded as a consequence of their ingestion of sarin. And one of the key questions before the UN Secretary General announced the report was whether or not Assad or his regime might be named as the responsible party. On the 9th of September, remember that the report was delivered to the UN Secretary General on the 13th of September 2013. On the 9th, so four days before the report was handed over, Secretary, then Secretary of State John Kerry said in a press conference in London, that Bashar al-Assad and his regime had one week to hand over the entire stockpile of chemical weapons to prevent a US attack on Syria in retaliation. One week from the 9th of September. And amazingly, that is exactly what Assad did within the space of one week. On the 12th of September, so the day before the UN Secretary General received the investigative report, Assad announced his intention to accede to the Chemical Weapons Convention. He deposited the instrument of accession through his uh, ambassador to the UN in New York at UN headquarters. And the US and Russia on the same day announced a joint framework for the elimination of Syria's chemical weapons. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which suddenly became galvanised because their jurisdiction was exercised as a consequence of Syria becoming a state party to the Chemical Weapons Convention, established a joint mission for the elimination of Syrian chemical weapons. And between October the 13th, when that announcement was made, so a month after the receipt of the report, and September 2014, the joint mission undertook most of its work and completed the destruction of declared chemical weapons production facilities as well as stockpiles of chemical weapons agents. That was quite an achievement when we think about the circumstances, the context in which it all happened because the conflict of course raged on throughout that entire period. And, uh, and I think it's quite impressive that um, international inspectors were able to verify the destruction of so much of the production facilities and the stockpiles. But well before the joint mechanism had completed its work, uh, 
allegations emerged of yet more violations of the Chemical Weapons Convention, this time mainly by chlorine, uh, the use of the weaponisation of chlorine gas delivered through barrel bombs and other uh, artillery shells. As a consequence of those allegations, the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons established a fact-finding mission which began to investigate these allegations and confirmed the use of chlorine several times throughout the calendar year of 2014. And this was the first occasion on which confirmed use of chemical weapons verified by independent international inspectors had occurred on the physical state territory of a state party to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Hardly, you know, sort of glowing endorsement, although I'm not making any allegations about who was responsible yet. These chlorine attacks continued into 2015, and the United Nations Security Council this time met and established a joint OPCW, Organisation of the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and UN joint investigative mechanism. So moving beyond the sort of fact-finding process, this time giving to the Joint Investigative Mission, mission often uh, referred to as the GIM, the mandate to not only verify that the attacks have occurred, but also to identify those allegedly responsible. And early in 2016, the GIM started to hand down periodic reports to the Security Council and the OPCW. And in a number of those, they identified several in incidents where they attributed responsibility some cases for the use of uh, chlorine gas to the uh, regime of, of Bashar al-Assad and on one other occasion ISIS for the use of sulphur mustard in a particular uh, suburb of Aleppo. This joint investigative me mechanism, the GIM, continued to report throughout 2016 and into 2017. And just before it was due to file a major report on a, an attack at Khan Sakun, the UN Security Council adopted or at least attempted to adopt a resolution to extend the GIMS mandate for another 12 months. And that resolution was vetoed by Russia. There are different ways of analysing or critiquing what was happening here. One view would be that Russia was trying to uh, protect Assad, uh, a client state uh, or client regime of the Russians. Uh, the Russians, as many of you know, had their only naval port on the Mediterranean in Latakia, the Syria port, Syrian port of Latakia. Uh, and both Hafez al-Assad and Bashar al-Assad have been client regimes of the, of the Russians. They've sold millions and millions, well, maybe hundreds of millions of rubles of arms and equipment to the Syrians. And they don't want to lose any of that. But another alternative explanation of what was happening was that the US was politicising the process of the gym and that it was trying to extend the mandate before the report on Khan Sakun was handed down in order to paint Russia in a poor light. And maybe there's truth in both of those alternative explanations of what was happening. But we know that in April 2017, President Trump launched 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles at a Syrian airfield and uh, that was in response to the most recent chemical weapons attack where President Trump said that even beautiful babies were cruelly murdered in this very barbaric attack and that no child of God should ever suffer such horror. I quote him verbatim because of course there were many other children of God going through horrendous suffering in Syria as a consequence of all the other egregious violations of the law. But this one, for some reason or other, was the one that evoked this particular response from the president. Now, a cynical interpretation of what was happening here in launching this attack could well be that this is President Trump's attempt to distinguish himself from what might be seen in some circles as the Obama administration's dithering in re response to the use of chemical weapons. We can demonstrate that President Trump is a man of action. We also know that a second uh, attack occurred uh, by the US in response to another use of chemical weapons in April of this year, 12 months almost to the date. This year, uh, 
President Trump had announced that he was going to withdraw US forces from Syria. And then there was a large chemical weapons attack very soon after that announcement in the city of Douma, with around 70 uh, Syrians killed from that attack. And as a response to that, uh, the US and other coalition forces, the UK, uh, sent another attack, this time Tomahawk cruise missiles, but targeted at alleged chemical weapons production facilities in Syria. And President Trump said this time he will continue to, con to, continue to, to undertake this sort of action until the Syrian regime stops its use of prohibited chemical agents. That's, uh, I mean, of course, not an exhaustive or comprehensive analysis of what's actually happened in response to chemical weapons, but I think a, an overview of what's gone on. Let us contrast it with so many other atrocities and egregious violations of international law, which include, and again, this is not an attempt to be exhaustive, just illustrative, the use of starvation as a method of warfare, the siege of cities, the sealing off of cities and preventing any fresh or even uh, long life uh, foodstuffs going into the city, preventing any fresh water going into the city to either flush out the civilian population or cause massive death inside the cities. We've seen intentional bombing of residential areas, including with high explosive weapons. We've seen indiscriminate attacks using barrel bombs and helicopter gunships. We've seen the denial of humanitarian aid. We've seen the intentional targeting of hospitals and health um, professionals. We've seen sexual enslavement. We've seen mass rapes. We've seen mass detentions, torture and summary executions. We've seen the deliberate targeting of cultural property and enforced disappearances on a massive scale. And the point is that in response to none of these has there been a use of military force with the sole exception of the circumstances in which ISIS have per perpetrated some of those atrocities. And then the US, Australia, the U UK, France, a number of other allied countries have come to the assistance of Iraq ostensibly to use uh, or to undertake a lethal aerial bombing campaign from Iraqi territory across into Syria targeting ISIS in Syria without um, the uh, consent or approval of the regime of uh, Bashar al-Assad. The decision of the Australian government to, to deploy Royal Australian Air Force F-18 Hornets caused quite a stir in Australia about whether this is a legal use of force or not. For the first few months of the operation, it was all justified on the basis of coming to the collective self-defence of Iraq, a sovereign nation, suffering attacks across its border from Syria by ISIS. A few months after the, um, the program of aerial bombing was initiated, the UN Security Council adopt a, adopted a resolution authorising all necessary means to undertake that very thing. So all of a sudden, uh, Australia and other countries engaged in this practice had the blessing of the Security Council in addition to a justification of self-defence. But apart from the use of lethal military force against ISIS, it's difficult to explain the disparate responses. The use of lethal military force on at least two occasions by the United States and other allied countries in response to chemical weapons attacks and nothing commensurate in relation to all the other egregious violations of international law. So let's try to unpack what might be the possible explanations for the disparity of this response. The first thing I think to observe is that we cannot say as an international community that this is about ignorance of the facts. Because the media reporting, uh, social media as well as mainstream media, has been extensive and extraordinary in the dramatic images of the suffering that um, Syrian the Syrian population has, has experienced. Some of you will remember the heart-rending image of that little boy who was dragged from the rubble of his own home and placed in the back of an ambulance, uh, completely covered in ash or, or dust and, um, and bleeding from a number of places and looking utterly helpless, helpless as perhaps illustrative of the suffering of the children all of God's children of Syria 
as a consequence of aerial bombing of the particular residential area that he was in, um, illustrative of what was happening in the rest of the country. And I remember reading the, some very powerful accounts from uh, doctors inside Syria saying they are shocked, they were shocked, that the West was shocked by an image like that, which for them was unfortunately, tragically, a daily experience. And then of course the shock dissipates after 24 hours or 48 hours and the news cycle moves on to whatever the next big story is. But we cannot as an international community say we don't have the information about what's been happening. And I think the calls, the expressions of despair by those within Syria about what would it take for a uh, more substantive response by the international community have been, uh, have been telling. In Ghouta, the suburb of Damascus, 2,000 people died. But at the same time in the Syrian conflict up until that, the point of that attack in August 2013, 100,000 people had already died from all the other causes, all the other violations of international humanitarian law that had been going on in that country. So one explanation that's been offered is that chemical weapons, the use of chemical weapons evokes a particularly visceral reaction. And the psychologists and some sociologists have written about the notion of an extreme weapon and the consequences, the psychological implications of us seeing images of the consequences of that. I, I struggle to accept that that is an adequate explanation of the disparate nature of the response because we have seen incredible incredibly evocative images of other su suffering caused by other means in Syria and have not had the same reaction. Perhaps, perhaps there is some element of a particularly visceral reaction here, but uh, for me, I don't think that's an adequate explanation. Second explanation is that there has been a long-standing taboo against the use of chemical weapons and the egregious and dramatic violation of that taboo somehow or other makes decision makers in the West decide we must do something to try to stop this, to try to preserve the normative prohibition from uh, a, a diminution of respect for it because there is no accountability or no substantive response to its ongoing use. Maybe there's some truth in that. We go back to 1899 and the first Hague Peace Conference for the inauguration of this taboo in some of the uh, early making of international law regulating the conduct of hostilities and see that right back then there were prohibitions on poison and on the use of chemical agents. World War I, of course, represented perhaps the, the quintessential violation of that prohibition and the reaction to that was the 1925 Geneva Protocol prohibiting the first use of chemical and bacteriological weapons. But other prohibitions, other normative prohibitions about particular categories of weapons or targeting of individuals have also, uh, targeting of the civilians, has also had a long-standing taboo. And that still doesn't seem to evoke the same reaction. So for me, I, I struggle to accept that the protracted nature of the prohibition on the use of chemical weapons is an adequate explanation of this disparate response. Then some people have tried to suggest that it's really out of care and concern for the Syrian civilian population. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding them in suggesting that? Surely that cannot be an adequate explanation because of all else that they have suffered. So we come to a rather cynical view of why this coalescence for the first time in the Syrian conflicts between Russian and American interests in response to the use of chemical weapons. Both major powers have chosen to sign up to the Chemical Weapons Convention and preclude from their own arsenal the possession, stockpiling, testing, acquisition or transfer, export, or use of chemical weapons. And so we don't want others to be able to have and use what we have committed to forego 
in terms of our own um, national arsenals. I think that's closer to the, to, the, to the explanation of what's really going on. Although I'm not prepared to discount altogether a contributing element of this particular nature of chemical weapons that invokes such a response. But what about the implications for international law? And here I'll finish up with a, a number of observations so that we can have some time for question and answers if, you've, if you're interested. There are four particular ones that I want to identify. The first is whether or not what's happened in Syria and the response to it has strengthened or undermined the normative legal prohibition on the use of chemical weapons. And there are arguments both ways on this. You could say that Syria as a mate prior to uh, 2013 as a major chemical weapons possessor state not party to the chemical weapons convention represented a threat to the normative prohibition on the use of chemical weapons and that by signing up that's one less of the major possessor states that is now a party to to the convention the others are also in the middle east egypt and israel are amongst them neither of them prepared to sign up to the cwc unless the other does. Well, at least that's their, that's their official position. But you can also argue that Syria having signed up to the Chemical Weapons Convention and then seeing uh, repeated violation of that very treaty undermines the pro prohibitive and normative nature of the Chemical Weapons Convention and all it represents. In some ways, the treaty prohibition is preserved if what happens by way of violation occurs on the physical territory of a non-state party. Instead, this is all happening now on one of the newest states' parties. Uh, I'm not real sure where I fall on that. I think those arguments both ways have, have some substance to them. I think if I was really pushed, rather than sitting on the fence, which is a convenient thing to do from up here, I'd probably say, I think Syria signing up and then these violations continuing to occur undermines the normative prohibition of chem on chemical weapons unless, unless the evidence ex demonstrates that it's not the regime of Bashar al-Assad actually or him himself that is uh, responsible for what's happening. More of that perhaps in question and answer. The second observation I would make is that the global criminal justice project, if we can call it that, still has a very, very long way to go. And what I mean by this, I mean, I haven't talked about it uh, earlier, but by any measure, surely, the Syrian catastrophe should be subjected to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And the only reason it isn't is because Syria not being a state party can only be referred to the jurisdictional competence of the court if the UN Security Council does that. Twice, at least, that I know of, the Security Council has attempted to do that, initiated by France, and Russia and China have both vetoed the resolution. Now, the ICC gets criticised regularly by people who don't understand the limitations to its jurisdiction about how it could possibly not be interested in prosecuting atrocities in Syria. It's a constant refrain of um, some in the Israeli cabinet. Why should the ICC be focusing on Palestine when just across the border hundreds of thousands of people have been murdered by the most obvious and egregious violations of the law? Well, the answer, of course, is uh, that is a little bit of education. The ICC, of course, would love to have jurisdiction, not love to. The, the, the ICC would welcome jurisdiction. The prosecutor of the ICC would welcome jurisdiction over the Syrian conflict. It would create a massive challenge for her in terms of investigating not actually what happened, but individual criminal responsibility for what happened. But she would welcome the opportunity to do that. But in terms of the way the jurisdictional limitations to the court are drafted in the Rome Statute, she and the court are precluded from the court exercising jurisdiction. That, for me, is the greatest challenge to the current criminal justice project internet globally. Because an ICC that's incapable of dealing with a catastrophe like this is an ICC that's better than anything we've had before it, but not enough. And those like me who are advocates for the merits and desirability of the court must concede and advocate for significant strengthening 
of that institution. The third observation is this, that the doctrine of responsibility to protect has just taken, or is taking on a daily basis in relation to Syria, a massive hit or a succession of hits. When the UN Security Council in 2011 adopted Resolution 1973, authorising all necessary measures to prevent the slaughter of the civilian population of Benghazi, Libya's second major city, as Muammar Gaddafi, then still in power, threatened to make Benghazi flow with the blood of its civilian population. The descriptive title in the UN Security Council resolution was the responsibility to protect the civilian population. And those uh, international lawyers like me who welcomed that thought, yeah, finally we're making some progress on the doctrine of the responsibility to protect, which is basically that the primary responsibility is that of the territorial sovereign nation state, but in circumstances where the state is unwilling or unable to protect its own civilian population, especially where it's the perpetrator of atrocity, the second responsibility, secondary responsibility is to the UN Security Council. And if the Security Council is precluded from acting, then responsibility falls to the international community, perhaps through the auspices of the UN General Assembly. Now in Libya, we thought we were making some progress. And perhaps NATO going beyond the mandate that was given in Resolution 1973 to pursue regime change uh, caused reticence amongst especially the Russian Federation and the Chinese for next time round. We'll be really careful not to permit all necessary means. So I think, uh, yeah, doctrine of responsibility to protect has taken some huge hits in the Syria crisis. And finally, one fourth observation about potential implications for international law. Perhaps, perhaps strict compliance with international humanitarian law is not sufficient. Last night I heard um, some presentations that um, Mark Glasgow and Trasser Dunworth were involved uh, in with a couple of other colleagues. Tom, uh, Tom is here, organised last night's event. And a number of the people speaking were talking about the fact that violence begets violence. In response to some passionate questions from particular members of the audience last night, uh, is, is, is responding to violence with violence the right way to go? I'm really conscious of the fact that in identifying diff, disparate responses to the use of chemical weapons and to all other atrocities, what sort of responses am I actually advocating for? Am I talking about why isn't the US going into Syria and blowing stuff up in response to the use of explosive weapons? Is that actually going to help? So I'm conscious of my own dilemma in dealing with a subject matter like this. But I'm also conscious of the fact that when even a state that claims to be strictly compliant with international humanitarian law, we must concede that mistakes are made, that hospitals get bombed mistakenly, that incidental damage to civilians and civilian property occurs. And as a person who has committed their professional career to the promotion of understanding of and respect for international humanitarian law, I can see that I am deeply troubled by this. And I'm not exactly sure what the right answer is. I am prepared to continue to argue for the importance of respect for international humanitarian law as providing some amelioration of the suffering of some victims of armed conflict, but I long for an international community prepared to invest many, many more resources into the avoidance of conflict in the first place, into strategies to prevent the outbreak of violence, because I understand and accept that that surely is more beneficial to those who will otherwise be victims of violence on spectacular scales like we are witnessing. Thanks very much.